Yo, what's good ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another legendary video. I'm your host, Davon. Appreciate you guys coming through and showing your love and support. As we get down to Friday Night Smackdown, which just concluded, which was live in Omaha, Nebraska. It was a decent card for what it was, but it could have been a lot more wrestling when it came to everything that had progress in tonight's showcase. Tonight's showcase had Cody Rhodes in the house as he was looking to address things that broke down with Randy Orton being injured by the blow arm. More importantly, the development story towards the WWE Undisputed Championship or SummerSlam as he takes on Solo Sokoa. And as well on the card tonight, we had women's champion Bailey having a face-to-face -face sit down with Nia Jax with the implication of their actual championship match. And it was pretty decent. It was fire for what they all both had to say. And I'm going to go ahead and get into that later on in the showcase. More importantly tonight, we have Tiffany Stratton. She was in singles action, taking on Mi Chan, Mia Yim in a decent singles match after things broke down last week when Mi Chan got involved in the whole drama that in a photo with Bailey and Nia Jax and Tiffany Stratton. But she has Bailey's back, but she's in singles action tonight with things broke down with some drama as well towards the end of that actual match. As well, we had Andrade taking on no other than Carmelo Hayes. This match was a banger. Highly recommend for you guys to check it out on YouTube so you can see how things were really were breaking down. But I enjoyed everything about that match, and they put on a banger in tonight's match on um, Friday Night SmackDown. More importantly, we have the Bloodline in the house as well, as they were looking to assort their dominance and prove a point of who runs Friday Night SmackDown. But more importantly, I appreciate you guys coming through for my channel. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And as well, the most important part, chime down in the comments, let me know how I'm doing this video, and then let's talk professional wrestling. But let's go ahead and get what you guys officially are here for, um, for Friday Night Smackdown, but let's go ahead and get this show started. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Friday Night Smackdown, this is on the way. It started off with Cody Rose kicking off tonight's Friday Night Smackdown in Omaha, Nebraska. His appearance when he came, when he was attacked by the bloodline last Friday. More importantly, he was ultimately forced to watch the faction put Randy Orton through a table. And Rhodes was set to face the bloodline leader Solo Sokoa at SummerSlam on August 3rd for the Undisputed WWE Championship on the line. Cody Rhodes addressed everything that he normally usually says. He broke down a decent segment. He basically talked about the heated battle of SummerSlam for the main event against Solo Sokoa. And in the match, doesn't feel like it's going to be a big title match because just the uh, presence of Solo Sokoa in general. But more importantly, he was fired up over the whole situation as of the bloodline and long as Roman Reigns and The Rock isn't around. And such things are kind of he hit some intriguing parts of his promo. But more importantly, Grayson Waller and Austin Theory interrupted him. It didn't take long before he even was about to get another sob story from Cody Rhodes. But they pretty much broke down things and pretty much started to berate him and going back and forth. But Cody Rhodes was into no games whatsoever. Um, he went straight at them, pretty much started brawling with them because he was in no mood whatsoever. He was looking to get his hands on the ball line. So he ended up getting to brawl with them. Um, things initially broke down um, as they ended up fighting. They threw Cody Rhodes directly out the ring. We ended up having seen him getting a steel chair from Boxer Crawford, who gave him a chair, and he took the took care of business to pretty much knock down um, Austin Theory, Grace, and Grayson Waller, and then his music hit as to end the segment. But in overall, it was pretty decent for it was. It was probably a, a fair mid at best. 3.2 out of 5, but it was decent to keep me invested when it comes to the build-up towards SummerSlam. More importantly, seeing how the shades of things continue to be progress with the bloodline, but it's going to be interesting when it comes to this match, but I feel like Cody Rhodes is going to retain the championship, but I feel like the build needs a little bit more of a niche, but we shall see how things continue to be pushed with the whole entire segment each and every single week to the build-up. But more importantly, the ball line has their hands full when it comes to Kevin Owens and Randy Orton having Cody Rhodes back. But as well as the threatening words when it came to Solo Sokoa, who was threatening Roman Reigns if he wants to come back, he's going to try to fight, take his tribal chief throne by force. 
And I feel like that's going to be the point where Roman Reigns makes his return. Then we have Carmelo Hayes, who is getting his hair cut at a barbershop. He's getting dressed in a video stylist. He spoke to the camera and says he beat Andretti. And he plans on beating them again as they get ready for them to pretty much get ready for that actual singles match. Cody Rhodes is then seen walking backstage and he's talking to Nick Aldis. Cody asks Aldis if he could make a match between Waller and Theory in a handicap match later on. But Aldis responded by saying um, he has the end of the night to find an initial partner. And this, and he's going to give him time to find somebody from there. Then we got ready for Andrade versus Carmelo. This match was a lot of back and forth. This match was a 9 minute and 45 second match. It was a lot of back and forth. I enjoyed everything about this match that had um, included with everything that went on. These boys put on a clinic with all their additional moves that went on. They were able to hit with their trademark moves. More importantly, the action was fast paced when it came early in the match. They start off by trading bows of traded a um, couple of blows back and forth, including a series of punches, takedowns, and pin attempts. Both guys also um, cut off each other repeatedly, but Hayes ultimately took control with the backwards um, draping springboard leg drop onto Andrade, who was hanging onto the second rope. The show then went into a commercial break, but when Hayes came back from the commercial break, he took advantage of the match. The show returns with a replay of the Spanish Fly as Hayes worked on Andrade's arm and the two ran the ropes as Andrade landed a tough clothesline to reset the match. As they both jolly to their feet, they continue to trade shots back and forth with each other. Andrade hits a pair of dragon screw leg whips and then Andrade pumps up the crowd and the crowd compels and gets excited from it. Then he has the running double um, knees onto Hayes who's jolly in the corner in the seated position. Hayes comes back with a little tilt to world face buster as things continue to progress from there. Carmelo Hayes and Andrade continue to battle on the top rope as Andrade executed his miss, 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 well, well, his missed moonsault into a standing moonsault sequence. And the crowd seemed to have loved a nice near fall from there. Then things continue to go back over as they continue to trade blow, strikes and blows back and forth. Andrade got into a spinning back elbow for a good near fall for two. Then Andrade went to the top rope, jumping to his first 48, but Andrade kicked out at a 2.8. Hayes went for the top rope and he missed nothing but net. From there, Andrade hits the messenger and picks up the pinfall for the one, two, three. This match was pretty decent. Uh, from my own personal opinion, it was maybe a 3.9 out of five stars. It was highly invested. I enjoyed everything that was the smoothest, and they have great chemistry in this match. But I'm pretty sure they're gonna fight again on speed, some kind of way on that Twitter show, which has been getting a lot of views as of late. But it apparently has been getting over 100%. Then we get to Bailey and Nia Jax. They're in a decent face-to-face -face sit down um, split image screen segment. Old school, stay, old school way of how WWE conducts things. Jax cut off Corey Graves, who was trying to ask questions. Jax says everyone should start feeling bad for Bailey because Jax is the one to put Bailey down at SummerSlam. Bailey says Jax hasn't changed after all these years. More than probably, Jax demanded to be called the Queen of the Ring. Bailey says Jax walked around like she owns the place. But Bailey recalls how Jax took Bailey out on SummerSlam in 2017. And then Bailey calls Jax a bit clumsy and reckless, which is kind of true. Nia Jax is known for hurting women all across the board. She's been doing a phenomenal job. She hasn't been injuring people lately, but she's still kind of like lackluster, kind of slow pace in her matches. But she still have been shown as a true big dominant woman in each and every single match she's been in. Jax stews up and then she got silent for a second and Jax says she's coming for the title because she wants to take it off Bailey. Bailey responded by saying she has bad news for Nia Jax. Bailey says she's changed after all these years and herself she will walk out as the SummerSlam with the WWE Women's Championship. Jax gets flustered. 
she torn off her mic and she ends up leaving that segment. It was decent for the was, but it was still mid at best. It was um, probably a solid three out of five for that segment, but it got the job done for the investment of the WWE Women's match. But more importantly, does it really set the tone? I feel like it's going to get pushed earlier in the night, but we shall see how things continue to progress with those ladies. Then we have Jay Cargill and Bianca Belair, who were shown backstage and they ran into Chelsea Green and Piper Nivens. They had a little chat about how things have been going, including calling Chelsea Green, calling Jay Cargill and Bianca losers. Then both teams wanted to talk to Nick Aldis, but pretty much Bianca challenged Chelsea Green to a match, and she said, we'll handle it directly in the ring. And then we got ready for Bianca Belair versus Chelsea Green. This match was very quick. It was kind of like a waste of time. I don't understand. It was not even a minute when it came to this match. Bianca defeated her very quickly. It started off with the match by um, Chelsea slapping Belair across the face. Belair ran to return the favor. Then Belair followed up with a couple of German suplexes. Soon after that, Belair set up the KOD. A green worked out of it into a roll up, but Belair only was able to have roll up green for the win for the one, two, three. Cargill has celebrated as well as Belair with her in the ring. Then we end up having a post-match segment by Alba Fire and Isla Dawn, who popped up on the screen. The champ said, we'll see about a tag team rematch. More importantly, they'll be in the house next week for Friday Night Smackdown. Then we have LA Knight and Logan Paul's contract signing, which is pretty decent. Um, there was a lot of back and forth. We had Nick Aldis, who was there to introduce them both. Um, this one was good. It was stiff, but it was okay for what it was, and it got the heat over for Logan Paul. More importantly, how much more can we say that LA Knight is just so over when it came to the story? And I feel like with every single moment they keep pushing, I feel like he's going to be the new United States champion at SummerSlam. They started off the segment pretty smooth. Nick Aldis stood in the ring and introduced LA Knight, and the crowd stood, stood there and they were chanting. That's very much and so when it comes to LA Knight. Then Logan Paul made his entry, the crowd booed the hell out of him. LA Knight chants started to break out during the segment. Paul lobbied into insulting Knight back and forth, and then asked the crowd why is he even giving Knight a shot for the United States Championship. Then LA Knight got on the microphone and says that maybe Logan Paul was right. That maybe Logan Paul should take a walk. But then Paul recounts that he walked down an hour a year ago and told Paul he can stick it to his bottle of prime. In the meantime, Logan Paul and LA Knight pointed out went back and forth with a couple of jabs. They went to a couple of shots with each other. Even LA Knight even talked about the situation of him in Logan Paul's house and everything that broke down. He also he took jabs at his brother when he talked about him being not a coward to fight Mike Tyson, but maybe he's a coward to fight him when it comes to some stuff for the United States Championship. More importantly, he put out the fact he's like, maybe you just don't have the balls to fight me when it comes to the championship and you just run around like a sorry ass bitch. Then things broke down as Logan Paul follow up by not hearing things then he said fine he initially um decided to sign the contract after la night got under his skin then he proceeded to leave as they both got into a verbal shout match after he was going back and forth with nick aldis in the middle trying to break them up logan paul left the ring with nick aldis la knight was celebrating having a contract in his hand then things broke down when logan paul ended up running back in the ring he jolly to tackle la knight take him down then things really broke down to a melee and a brawl and both guys were trying to get off the signatures la knight was trying to get off his bfmt while logan paul was trying to get the punch in after a couple sequences and logan paul ended up rolling off the ring and then he started arguing with a fan after the situation broke down and proceeded to cheer with the fans after their segment but then we had a deep highlight package of the pink bubblegum video of no other than tiffany striding Tiffany Times always ready, but this is a great highlight picture, and I see her winning the WWE Women's Championship. Illinois 
is shown walking backstage, runs into Santos Escobar, who reminds Knight that he was in a match at Madison Square Garden a few weeks ago, and Escobar did not get the pin. But Knight said that in some free time, if Escobar wants to get in touch with Knight, Escobar mom has his number. Escobar kind of shrugs it off and sets a match between them in the ne next week when it comes to singles action. Then we have women's action, Tiffany Stratton taking on Mi Chen, Mia Yim. This match was a lot of back and forth, pretty decent. Um, I enjoyed everything about this women's match, but it was okay for what it was. The match started off pretty smooth, pretty clean. Mi Chen started to get fired up, landed a couple of series of kicks. In the Fury with a couple of neck breakers, as in Mi Chen then hit a Tornado DDT for a two count. Stratton came back with a running kick to Mi Chen's chest and got a two count as well. Stratton then proceeded to go to the top turnbuckle to put Mi Chen up there. But Mi Chen countered with a shotgun drop kick off the top ropes. Stratton then rolled to the outside and managed to run Mi Chen into the ropes until she was cut off by Nia Jax and then Stratton took advantage of the situation with a rolling senton. Then Bailey appeared out of nowhere through Jackson to the timekeeper's area and Bailey hit Nia Jax with the money in the great thief case. Bailey then proceeded to break the money in the big briefcase, open it up, and then beat the hell out of it for some weird reason. Then the result of all that after Tiffany Stratton got distracted, Mi Chen was able to hit the roll up for the one, two, three to pick up the victory. After match, Bailey rolled um rolled the heat of the beat case back in the ring. And Bailey and Mi Chen celebrated as Tiffany Stratton looked frustrated. She's able to still grab her beating down briefcase, but she was looking on looking pretty sad. Then we have the bloodline. They had their pretty decent segment. It was pretty decent for what it was. And they were in the dark room when it came to how they were doing this little segment. Solo said the life is so good when you're the tribal chief. Sokoa said that life is always so busy because of that, because he doesn't have a moment to himself. Solo says he wonders who will step up and be Cody's partner later on, which may proxy will be disrespect to the blow line. More importantly, Solo says if you are on Cody's side, you are an enemy to the blow line. Solo says uh, tonight it better be a handicap match or someone will pay the price at the hands of the blow line. Then it broke down from there as the end of that segment. This is going to be intriguing. The blonde is going to be involved in tonight's main event, some way or some fashion. If Cody has to go alone, it would be kind of interesting. But, you know, he will have no problem being a super Cody. But most importantly, he'll probably have a partner. Then he hype up next week's match in the sixth um, team number one contender match that happens for the WWE Tag Team titles. And as well as Bailey and Meechan will take on Nia Jackson to be striving in tag team action. As well as LA Knight taking on Santos Escobar. Which those matches should be pretty decent when it comes to next week. We'll she see how things continue to follow up on the road to SummerSlam with everybody building up the card and stacking it up towards Cleveland. Cody Rose is shown backstage, walking backstage, and then Kevin Owens walks up, taking his um, his fist and he ended up walking out and the camera shot shows Kevin Owens making his entrance Cody Rhodes makes his entrance as well then a top down comes down as well then things this match was pretty decent it was almost close to a 12 minute match a lot of back and forth more importantly they kept the transition of tag team moves and this was just a full-on brawl fall the action spilled out early when Theory grabbed Owens by the beard at one point then Waller held Cody Rhodes before alone and then Theory pounded on Cody Rhodes, who was the legal man. Waller worked on Cody until Cody fired up and he was able to get the hot tag on Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens came in and stumped the mud hole, directing on Grayson Waller. Everyone back in the inside of the ring and Owens landed a clothesline on Waller and Theory. Back inside the ring, Owens hits a cannonball on Grayson Waller. Then Owens then went to the top and then went for a swan tongue. But Waller gets to his knees and then tags in Theory, who hits a rolling drop kick on Kevin Owens. Then Waller proceeded to tag in and land an elbow on Owens for a two count. 
Then the show continued to go back for their final commercial break. When they came back from the break, the show came back to Waller and Owens battling on the top rope until Owens hits Waller off the top rope following with that lovely swan song. Cody then receives the hot tag and starts beating the hell out of Theory. Waller gets a blind tag, but Cody hits a DDT on Theory. Waller then runs in and then lands a rolling face buster for a two count. Then Theory tags in Waller and nearly hits Theory. But Owens lands a stunner on Grayson Waller. Cody hits the crossroads as Theory fell down to the L as Cody Rhodes pick up the victory. Then they can't even get the chance to celebrate as the bloodline ended up coming down to Solo Sokoa's entrance. Three members, which was Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa, and Solo Sokoa came down to get into a brawl for all directly with Cody Rhodes and Kevin Owens. This battle went on to the outside and then set up the two tables, but the initial announce table. Jacob Fatu cut everything off after Cody Rhodes and Kevin Owens just got to put Solo Sokoa through a table. As he continued to be the true workforce of the bloodline and then picked the part of Kevin Owens from the ring and hit multiple repeated sentons directly in the corner. That old school manga style senton in the corner. Then on top of that, Solo Sokoa and Tama Tonga put the beat down directly on to um, Cody Rhodes and basically had him watch the massacre of Kevin Owens getting beat down. Then things continue to break down as Tonga Loa and um, finally showed up. Then Fatu hits a flying headbutt on Kevin Owens and then the blind left Cody and they triple bomb through a announce table. Then Tonga puts a chair around Kevin Owens' neck and ran Owens' head into the ring post. The long bloodline poses with a finger in the air to cut off the air and the, chan the fans chanted we want Roman. Let's send Friday Night Smackdown for a closing. More importantly, the bloodline continue to be dominant. I don't know how Cody Rhodes is going to be valiant when it comes to the situation, but seems like the storyline is going in the same direction that we already know where it's going. Cody Rhodes is going to retain. Roman Reigns is going to make his return, and he's going to take back his seat. But will it be with the new bloodline, or will it be with him returning with Jimmy Uso? and Jay Uso to help him out leading towards Bad, bad Blood in the near future. But in overall, the show was pretty decent. A lot of back and forth. I enjoyed everything about it. It was pretty mad at best when it came to everything that happened. But the action still kept me invested when it came to professional wrestling. The storylines continue to be very mid leading to SummerSlam. But they got to pick it up and get it, keep us invested when it comes to all the overall storylines. But importantly, I appreciate you guys coming through and show your love and support. Chime down in the comments and let me know how you felt about this actual show. And let's talk professional wrestling. More importantly, hit the like button so you get the algorithm for this video to continue to run smoothly. So we'll get through with the YouTube and other outlets. But I appreciate you guys coming through and showing your love and support. Until the next episode, I'll catch you guys later. Peace.